Thank you, Pastor Jeff. I love this guy. He's such a blessing to all of us. So, hey, Doug, Doug and Kareen uh, Loewenberg are uh, missionaries to Ethiopia. In 1999 of June, our missions program had only gone for the whole year, ever given only $40,000. I went to Ethiopia, met them, and saw a really land desperate for the gospel. And my heart was broken by the poverty. And I, I, God spoke to me on the airplane and worked me over good and challenged me to believe for a cash offering in uh, first Sunday of October in 1999, which should be our nine-year nine church anniversary. We were saving money to give it to our, to pay off our building. People have been saving and we decided to give all that money to the project for the Bible college. And so in that offering, it was over $68,000. And the first time, and it was a, a miracle because that's more than we've given in a whole year. And after that, missions started going up and up and up. And from the day we announced that offering, uh, the, the church started growing, people started getting saved, people started coming and offerings started going and the church just took off. And uh, I know that, that a heart for the lost in foreign lands is, is what God wants for us. He wants a heart for the lost here. And we, we really have a, a, a sin sick country. And I hope you'll come back and hear my message tonight that I have. I think that will be helpful to all of us. But we need, we need to continue to reach all over the world. And we, we gave that money to plant a Bible college there and to get this Bible college built. This built, they've got some foundational issues and need to add another floor on it. And they've raised a lot of the money they need. They need literally the leftover amount, believe this or not. Our goal for that offering in 1999 was 50,000 cash in one offering on our nine year anniversary of the church. 68 came in today. I, I said, well, how much more do you need to, to, to take care of this Bible college thing? He said, 50 more thousand, 50, the same amount. So I said, well, we, we'll all pray and give each one of us what we want to give. So that's all I'm asking you to do. And we're not going to even pass a bucket by you. But as they share, would you just pray, God, what would you have me give? And if it's a dollar, give it. We did this one time. I, more than once, we've had people write checks that big or bigger. And... Uh, so they need not only that, but add a floor. So any, they, you can't give them too much. I'll tell you that. But these, these are, these, listen, there are, there are 25 Bible college stations all over Ethiopia because of our participation back in 1999, a few other churches that also helped put that Bible college there. I was just there for the 25th anniversary of the Assemblies of God. I, I was honored to be one of the speakers. 25th year anniversary of the Assemblies of God, their general council, the national gathering. And uh, because our Bible college is the only Bible college there, the 25 outposts all over the nation, you can get trained to be a minister. The, every denomination but one is a full gospel believes in the power of the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, all of them but one denomination, and even the prime minister is filled with the Holy Spirit, and that nation has changed, I'm telling you, from 99 to when I just went there a year ago. And I want you to open your heart to give generously and hear God, and don't be afraid to write a big check, or you can get it out of the uh, bank and give it later. But Doug and Cream, would you give them, a, our missionary heroes, a big hand and welcome them. Thank you, Doug and Cream Lowenberg. Dr. Lowenberg. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, we're just very honored, thrilled to be here. You guys endured a little bit of rain, <coughs> and you're here. And we're so proud of the men and women who have served this country in the military. God bless you so much on this 4th of July weekend. But Pastor, we are, Pastor Weaver, Pastor Jeff, we are thrilled to be here today and want to share a little bit of what we see God doing. And you are key partners in what God is doing in Ethiopia. I want Kareen to greet you. We'll do a little bit of a PowerPoint overview of what we do. Then I'll share a brief message from the word. Thank you, New Hope Assembly. You have left your footprints 
in Africa and especially in Ethiopia. And to think that you started way at the beginning when the Bible school began. And now to see so many students who have been transformed. You know, one of the good things about getting old, older, <laughs> is you see what God has done. In those 25 years, we'll have students come back saying, God has helped me to reach out to the Muslims. God has helped me to do this. When you invest in Bible school students and our pastors, they're the ones, right, who are going to be transforming the nation. So thank you for doing that. And ATWM, we are missionaries sent from the Assemblies of God World Missions. The theme this year is sent. So thank you for sending us. And you also support our daughter, Tracy, or Julia and Tracy Peterson, who are serving with Africa. And, you know, a theme this year as well is that from our local churches, you will be sending your sons and daughters. We need more workers. We're there, but may God speak to you. Jesus Gaetano, Jesus Yadanal, that says Jesus is Lord and Jesus saves. If I were greeting you in an Ethiopian service, the focus is always on Jesus because Jesus is hidden in the Orthodox Church in Islam and Jesus is the one, right, that is the difference that is needed in our world. And I love your, your statement on your website. We're on a mission to go to heaven and take as many as possible with us. Now that includes Iowa, Urbandale, and it includes Ethiopia, but it's through Jesus, isn't it? But Doug and I love serving in Ethiopia. It's a time now of open doors. It's a time of God's favor and to be able to serve there. And one of the highlights was the official launching of the Ethiopia Assemblies of God Women's Ministries. Believe it or not, we have not had a formal Women's Ministries Department. So we thank God for that. But would you pray that God would help it to grow? Because we know that the church is made of men, women, teens, youth, and we're going to need all of us to reach our world and to reach Ethiopia for Jesus. So it's great being here with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. If you'll look at the screen, uh, a real quick, quick overview of the next slide. This is the whole continent of Africa. Um, 1.45 billion people in Africa. Some people say 58 different countries. On the east side, you see that little, it's in green, but the little horn that sticks out, we call that the Horn of Africa. And just inside that is Ethiopia. The next slide, it's more of a focused picture. So on our east is Somalia, on the west, Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, and then just across the Red Sea, Yemen, Saudi Arabia. So we really believe God has postured Ethiopian a key place for reaching up to the north and to the east to reach into the Islamic world. And so we're excited about what God is and will continue to do. Next slide. Some of you may not realize how large Ethiopia is. You can put two Texases inside Ethiopia and have room to spare if you're from Texas. Sorry about that. Uh, but it's very large. We, we are the second largest populated country in Africa um, with uh, over 120 million people. Next slide. Some parts of Ethiopia are extremely high. Some of the mountains are over 15,000 feet. We don't get snow, but we do get some hail. So you can get into those high places and then you can go down below sea level to 300 feet below sea level. You'll see in the next slide uh, some of the arid desert places. That slide on the left is an area called Borana. And I was there not long ago and they have gone two and three years in places without a drop of rain. So just the difficulty of reaching some of these people. But one thing we're so thankful for, the next slide is Ethiopia is the home of coffee. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can see even the twins will come all the way to Ethiopia to drink coffee. 
But they, they say that Ethiopia was uh, discovered, I mean, excuse me, coffee was discovered in Ethiopia and we love, love this stuff. Next slide. One of the things that is very challenging is over 50% of the population are part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Now that sounds good because they do believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But if you can look carefully at that icon on the bottom left, that really kind of just pictures everything, the challenges that are there. Jesus is there, but to get to Jesus, you go through Mary, through the saints, through the angels, through the priests, through pilgrimage. And very, very few uh, Ethiopian Orthodox people have, don't even know what it means to have a personal experience and have Jesus living in their heart. The next slide, the priests are so important and uh, these ancient crosses that some would date back over a thousand years and you touch that and it's blessing and it's immediate salvation. On the other hand, next slide, 30 some percent of Ethiopia are Muslims following the teachings of Muhammad and they're gathering and, and that church is growing. During the message, I'll point out the, the guy on the left with the big dark beard, his name is Sheikh Muhammad and I'll say more about him in a few moments. But anyway, the challenges of Orthodox Church and Islam, and yet the church is advancing. Next slide. So our work is primarily helping build the national church and working in our Bible schools. This year, 2024, the Ethiopia Assemblies of God have committed to trying to plant 1,000 new churches. We only have 1,000, so basically we're trying to double in the year 2024 so that we have a church within walking distance of every Ethiopian. Well, that means we have to work hard in the Bible schools. Next slide. So it's a privilege to work and train. That's the Bible school back behind in our current principal, Ermisha. So we're working to try to shore up a wall and strengthen the foundation of that building, but investing, the, the larger group down below is the master students, and Karina and I have been directing that program over the last number of years. Next slide. So committed to training. Um, the, I'm also the director of an association for Pentecostal theological Bible schools all over Africa. And so I have the privilege of working with uh, a wonderful board and, and students from everywhere. That slide up above, and this is very exciting. Uh, this is a, uh, in Ethiopia, it's one of those 25 schools that we have around the country. We have had 104 young men and women Ethiopians in that school for the last, um, well, actually over two years, training to go plant churches. And just yesterday was the, the commissioning, and I believe it was about 80 of them were commissioned, and they're moving out today to go in throughout Ethiopia and plant more churches. Uh, next slide. So just the growth. We, we help bring in key people that can make an influence and add to the strengthening of the church. Uh, some of you may recognize Dr. Hagen, the former uh, president up at North Central. But this was our um, a conference that we had just a few weeks ago. And we have people there from Tanzania, Kenya, USA. Try, uh, this emphasis was on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and seeking the empowerment of the Spirit. But then also, next slide, we've had some people from our region. Mark Dean was there, the, the current district superintendent up in Minnesota, and brought a team a few years ago. But the next slide, you just need to hold your breath because this is totally awesome. There's one real tall guy in the middle on the left, and in the middle, you may recognize uh, Pastor James Weaver came with a group for the Holy Spirit Conference. We greeted them at the airport. In the next slide, uh, he pre go to the next slide, he preached thunder. Can you see the anointing? You can see the interpreter, he's stunned. <laughs> At the profound, but the, I tell you, uh, Pastor Weaver just was such a blessing. Uh, although, you know, there's another side of him, next slide. And so you need to keep praying for him. You know him. Uh, we got, after some of the services, went to a little souvenir shop, and this is a Muslim gal, and he's just showing grace to her and waving our Ethiopian flag, but we were so thrilled to have him and the other group come and be with us for the conference back in February. Next slide. 
So we're wanting to build and plant the church. Some of our churches are vast. The one on the left is our oldest church, one of our largest churches. But then some are just little corrugated tin or they made out of sticks. And to try to get to them, it's kind of simple. Uh, some are under a mango tree. Some are in a schoolhouse. But we're planting the church and reaching people. Next slide. So it's thrilling to do that. Our general superintendent, and his name is Ayansa Obsi. He's just a young man, 41 years old. But part of our strategy, and he's pointing right at the border of Ethiopia and Somalia, is to plant churches on those borders of Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, and the north and Eritrea. Because then people can move on both sides. It's not possible to send full-time missionaries into either Somalia or Sudan. But we can plant churches and people can move back and forth. So that's part of our strategy, what we're trying to do in ministry. Next slide. Uh, we're also, we have another missionary school in one of those outreaches where we're training young men and women from Ethiopia to go reach unreached people groups. And in Ethiopia alone, we have 37 unreached people. So we're training them and then sending them to go live and learn language and reach those people among us. The next slide, please. Um, one of the, the areas that, and I'll talk more about this man, his name is Peter. Just uh, two and a half months ago, he was sent from Addis Ababa to our neighboring country, South Sudan. That's the newest nation in the whole world. Uh, it seceded out of Sudan in 2011. He has gone to Juba to plant the Assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God does not exist in South Sudan. I got a note yesterday from him. He's now planted three churches in the last two months. So we need to pray for our dear brother. He's struggling with health and the demonic attacks, but God is using him and we just pray God will continue using him and then we want to come in and start a Bible school and reach that nation for the Lord. Next slide. Kareen mentioned about women's ministries and, and she was very much involved in helping get this women's group gathered together. Some of the guests were Faraja, the leader of women's ministries for all of Africa and then a dear friend that I know some of you know, Trina Pennington. So it was, it was great to see that launched and now we want to move it forward. We're also concerned about next generation. So you can see some of the children in this slide. Um, and we just, we're praying that if Jesus tarries in the years to come, those are going to be the leaders that are going to reach the nation and go beyond to our neighbors to, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as I bring this presentation to a close, uh, thank you for praying for us and our family. On the next slide, you already are supporting Julia and Tracy. They, they are in and out of Ethiopia helping us with curriculum. Julia oversees 20 different language projects of material that are used all over the continent. That's her husband, Tracy. He's working with Afri Africa Tabernacle Evangelism. We're teaching in our Bible schools in five different languages. So Julia is a key part of what we do. Next slide. And this is our other daughter, Ruthie, and her husband, Devin, and our two wonderful grandkids, Nolan and Emily. Uh, God has called them to serve, and they're in little islands in between Mozambique and Madagascar in the Indian Ocean, reaching out to Muslims who have never, ever, ever heard the gospel. So we're thankful that our kids have grown up loving us, loving Jesus, loving Africa, and serving. So thank you. Last slide is just a reminder. Keep praying for us as we want to be faithful and finish the race and run hard until Jesus comes. Thank you. Would you take your Bible, please, and turn to the Gospel of Luke, the last chapter in Luke. Wow. What happened? Praise the Lord. Turn to Luke. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk to you for a few more moments this morning on the subject, keep open to the gospel. Keep open to the gospel. And let me just talk about that a minute before we read the text. Are you, am I an open-minded person? Open-minded can be described as you are receptive, you are open to consider new and different thoughts or perspectives or ways of doing things. Open-minded people are more interested in listening than speaking. 
Open-minded people are more interested in understanding rather than being understood. Well, the opposite, the closed. I, I know it all. You can't tell me anything. Uh, I've already got the method and the procedures and the perspective figured out. I mean, think about where you stand. Is there an open-mindedness or is there kind of a closed-mindedness, not wanting to be challenged? You want to speak more than you want to listen. You already understand. As you keep that in mind, open, being open to the gospel, open-minded, let's read the text and I'll start at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them, two of the disciples in the same day, you go back to the beginning of the chapter, is the first day of the week, the day in which Jesus was resurrected. So on that same day, the day of Jesus' resurrection, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles, 11 kilometers, probably west of Jerusalem, And they were talking to each other about everything that had happened. Now, some people who look at this text say, you know, because things weren't going the way they expected, the way they felt Jesus had predicted and and all of their expectations, now because of his death and they hadn't seen anything, even the followers of Jesus were fragmenting. They were going their different ways, doing their own thing, maybe going back to their former lifestyles. We're not told exactly what, but here are two that are walking away from Jerusalem on that Sunday morning, the third day, verse 15. And as they talked, they were discussing all of those things that had happened. But I love this. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. So they're walking, you can just see it. And Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? And listen to their answers. And I think part of the reason why, I mean, Jesus, the risen son of God, he's walking with them, but they don't don't know who he is. And I think part of it is he's allowing them just to express very honestly, they're not having to give the politically correct answer. They're just able to pour out their grief, their despondency, their despair, their hopelessness. Look, listen, they say, well, we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth. He was, past tense, he was a prophet. Powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over. He was sentenced. He was crucified. We had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But now it's the third day. Some of the women went to the tomb. They amazed us a little earlier in that same chapter. It says, when these women came and told the disciples, they just thought it was nonsense. And they didn't believe. So that you, can, you can just picture all of the issues, the dynamics that are going on, they're walking along. And, you know, maybe, um, maybe they expected Jesus to rise from the dead. They hated that he was crucified. And think about how terrible that is because the crucifixion is totally humiliating. It's an embarrassment. It's, it shows Jesus seems weak. He is cursed by God. We thought he was a prophet. He did all kinds of miracles. But then he ends up getting crucified terrible death physically and spiritually he's been buried looks and maybe they got past that but they certainly expected on the third day for Jesus to rise from the dead and maybe then the angels would come from heaven and the Romans would be wiped out and those evil chief priests and the people in the Sanhedrin would have God's judgment it's the third day nothing has happened Jesus is walking along with them. Verse 25, how would you like it? You're walking, you're kind of spilling your guts. You're, you're terribly dis, uh, disappointed and hopeless and in despair and you don't know what, what's next. And you're telling this guy and the guy looks at you and says, you foolish and heart of heart people. Well, thank you very much. I mean, that's what it says. You, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer and then enter his glory? 
Boy, I wish, I'd, I wish they'd had videos in those days. In verse 27, and beginning with Moses, that would be Genesis and the Pentateuch and all of the prophets. That's really describing the entire Old Testament. He explained to them what was in all the scripture concerning him. What an amazing Bible study. They're walking seven miles. They're walking. He's talking. He's teaching. Oh, you fools, slow of heart. Uh, He had to suffer. You know, think about the, the significance of Jesus saying, this isn't something that just happened now. This has been prophesied, seen by God from the very beginning of time that him's coming. He had to suffer. He had to take on himself the punishment of our sin and all humanity. It wasn't just, I'll give you a go card. Okay, we'll let it slide. He came as the perfect lamb to suffer the consequences of our sin and the judgment of our sin, he came to suffer and he knew that. But then just very quickly, he jumps and says, but that's not the end of it. And to enter his glory, hallelujah, enter his glory. They're walking along, they get to the inn, holiday inn maybe, Hampton, one of them. And Jesus acted like he was going to go on, but they convinced him it's night, you need to stay. And I love the way this reads. It says, verse 30, when they were at the table, he took the bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. Have you read that before? I mean, they, not long before that, in fact, uh, would it be 40 days before they had been there at that final communion, just like we celebrated. And, I, you know, they're seeing this and thinking, man, I, I think somehow I've seen this. But he did the same thing when they were out with the 5,000 men and with the 4,000. This is maybe the fourth time. And all of a sudden, something happens. And I love the way Luke records this. It says in verse 31, then there eyes were opened and they recognized him open to the gospel what i what i see in this text and what i want to challenge to you is you know there i think there are times that we can be in despair because god has not done what we wanted when we wanted in the way we wanted i mean none of them expected you see that back in matthew chapter 15 16 where Peter took Jesus when Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross. And he said, God forbid it, Lord. We're not going to let this happen to you. These guys are walking there. They're despondent. They're in despair. They don't even realize the King of kings and the Lord of lords is right there walking with them. Some of you maybe got up this morning kind of feeling this way. Do you know Jesus was there even though you didn't see him and recognize him? And he just wants honesty, even though we're confused and we're in despair and we're hurting and we don't know what direction there is ahead of us, but he's there and there's a correction because he has taught them, he has shown them, they have had the entire Old Testament, but they have been hard-hearted, they have been resistant, they have chosen not to believe the revelation of God, they have been closed instead of open, are you? But then there was a miracle. And I'm praying that miracle happens in all of us today. It says, and their eyes were opened. Obviously, they had, their eyes had been opened physically, but there was a dimension that needed to happen supernaturally, spiritually, that they could recognize who Jesus was. And in that context, the one who provides the bread, the one who has given them his blood in, in, through the communion, the one who has established a new covenant. I mean, here is the one they thought was dead, and he is alive. He is ruler. He has conquered death. His sacrifice was enough and his resurrection vindicates everything that he said and if he said it and it was true then it's true in the future may God open our eyes today to see him for who he truly is even in spite of it not happening exactly the way we want and when we want he is there God open our eyes Pastor Ashanafi is one of our pastors way over on the east side of Ethiopia near the Somali border. 
Ashanafi was a Muslim. He was a police officer. He was very corrupt. And he was addicted to a bush that grows there called chat or cot. It's an amphetamine, and it grows all over that part of the country, and it's legal, and it's exported to our neighboring countries, and there's a lot of cash that flows. It's considered a cash crop. And you go to markets, especially in Diradawa, I mean, it would, the market would be larger than the church, and there's just thousands and thousands of these bushes gathered together. They're trimmed, and they're selling them. And then you'll see people sitting on the streets, eating the leaves, eating the bush, eating the little pods. And they're just, they, they're out of it. Well, he, here's this man, Ashanafi, police officer, addicted. He was married, had kids, and his wife came to him at one point and said, Ashanafi, your life is so messed up. I don't know if I can continue to live with you. He just laughed it off, took another couple of bites, and he just uh, passed out. And he said, while he was there, passed out, he had a revelation. And he saw himself standing in a building he'd never been in before, and he was there holding some kind of book and pointing his finger, and he just thought, that is so weird, and then he, would, he just completely fell asleep. Not long after that, his wife came again and said, Ashanafi, I have found the Lord. She, in her desperation, had gone to our little local AG church and had met the Lord and been saved. She said, I want you to come to the church, and if you refuse, I'm, I'm going to begin to push and file toward divorce. Well, out of despair, he said, okay, I'll go. He walked into the church. He'd never been there before. Remember, he's a policeman, big, mean, gruff guy, Muslim background. And he said, when I walked in there, I looked at the building, and I said... I've been here before. And while he was there, God opened his eyes and he said, over on the left side, he saw Jesus looking at him and said, Ashanafi, you need to give your life to me. I'm not just the prophet. I am the Savior and the Son of the living God. And that just so blew him away. He began to call out to the Lord for salvation and deliverance and freedom and transformation. And then he felt called to the ministry. He came to our Bible school at the Sabbath Bible College four years later. The pastor who had been there at that time was transferred. They asked Ashanafi to become the pastor of the church. Somebody took a photo and gave it to him. And he said, when I got that picture, I was astonished because it was the exact picture I'd had in that vision when I was uh, out of my mind on chat, lost in the world. I was standing there holding a book, pointing my finger, preaching, and that was the exact place I had seen in that vision. God opened his eyes to see who Jesus really is. The very next verse, verse 32, is another powerful statement because then these, Jesus disappeared. I think he didn't want them hanging on to him and he had more things to do. So he takes off and it says in verse 32, and they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I don't think it's an accident. Luke intentionally talked about their eyes were opened, but once eyes are opened, then it says the scripture was opened. You know, these men, they had been following Jesus three and a half years. They'd grown up in Israel from their earliest childhood. They would have been in the synagogue studying the Old Testament, but not until they really came to know Jesus were they able to look at the scriptures through new eyes and in a different way. And it, Jesus told them, I mean, when we read a little bit earlier, it said, he talked about from beginning with Moses through the prophets, all this, the scriptures said concerning him. I wonder if on that conversation, as their eyes were opened and they looked at the biblical text, they saw Genesis 3.15 differently. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent will bite him on the heel. Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and your seed, but through your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. I think about in Genesis 22, that day that Abraham took his son Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. And you remember the great words of Abraham? He said, my son, God himself will provide the lamb. But jumping over to one, a passage that we all know so well, Isaiah chapter 53, 
wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. But, but I thought this was the mighty arm of God, crushed for us. And we can go on and on. But in that moment, having seen Jesus for who he was, now the Bible is opened in a new way. And there is what I would call spiritual heartburn. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us and opened the scripture? Not only do I pray our eyes are open today that we would have a fresh understanding and vision of who Jesus is, but I pray those of you who say, oh, I already got the Bible pretty well figured out. You know, Genesis, Revelation, Matthew, uh, someplace that Isaiah, that you will just be open to say, there is so much more, so much more of God and revelation and depth that you will keep digging and studying, not that you have more knowledge only, but that you can know God more richly and make him known. He opened scripture. I, I pointed out in the slides that big, heavy, bearded fellow, Sheikh Muhammad. Sheikh Mohammed is an Ethiopian, grew up in Ethiopia, but he was zealous for Islam. He went to Pakistan to study more about Islam, became part of a really zealous Muslim group called the Wahhabis, and then he had come back to Djibouti, which is on our northeast border, and was in a mosque doing further study, evangelizing on behalf of Islam, and he went to his imam, and he said, can you get me a Bible? Because I want to know the Bible well enough that I can undermine the faith of Christians and just confuse them. And the imam thought that was a great idea. So he got him a Bible and he began to read. He'd never read the Bible before. And he's reading and he's reading and he's reading. And the Lord appeared to him as he was reading and said, this is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not just a prophet. I am the risen son of God. And by reading the scripture and the Lord beginning to open up his eyes in the word, he came to faith in the mosque on that very day. He walked over to the imam and said, the Lord has shown me that the Bible is true and I need to follow Jesus and, and devour this book. I'm checking out, I'm leaving Islam. He came back to Ethiopia and today he is raising up other Muslim background believers and planting them in mosques so they can sit around and have fellowship with two or three or four seekers and they are being led to the Lord in the mosques throughout Ethiopia today. Because scripture, scripture was opened. Lord, open our eyes to see you. Open scripture that we can know you more and see that you are in control and, and have confidence in your revelation. Now let me fast forward over to verse 44. And this is what I told you. See, now Jesus has gone and met with all the disciples. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of the prophets and the Psalms. Verse 45, and he opened their minds. So that they could understand the scripture. And he said, this is what is written. Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Verse 47 is crucial. And repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He opened their eyes to see. He opened the scripture so they could read the word in a new way. And then it says he opened their minds. To understand what? That they not only would better understand what Jesus came to do, but that they would begin to really grasp what it was that God was calling them to do. Jesus had done what only he could do, die and rise from the dead. But now it was up to them to be the witnesses to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins beginning in Jerusalem. But notice Jesus says, to the ends of the earth. That was hard for a Jew. But Jesus was saying, I'm going to give you the power. And at the end of the passage says, but wait for the power of the Spirit to come upon you. My prayer for us today Number one, that we see Jesus with new open eyes. Open, not closed. Number two, that, that the scriptures are opened and there is ongoing revelation of God's written word into our hearts. 
But number three, we need our minds open, not only about understanding his mission, but ours. Our responsibility to be his witnesses. We begin in Jerusalem, but we take it to the ends of the earth. I showed you the picture of Peter Dorr, the man who has gone from Ethiopia to Juba, and he's there at this very moment. He doesn't have a lot of money, he is struggling. He wrote, he said, I'm sick, I'm really battling, it's rainy season, but he has gone recognizing the mission. And see, missions is for us, but it's every church going everywhere. May God open your mind, may God open my mind to recognize Jesus did his part, but now there's our part. Let it begin in your home and in your school and in your business and in greater Des Moines and throughout Iowa, but we can't stop there. The the great shores of America, they're 42% of our world. It's hard to believe, 42% of the world have not heard the gospel. Lord, open our minds. May we be willing to go through our prayers, through our giving, But God, I believe you want to continue to call sons and daughters from New Hope to go and be witnesses and proclaim the gospel to the nations of our world where you have never been proclaimed. Open to the gospel. Open eyes, open word, open minds. Are you available? Send me, please. Would you stand? just response and I want you to make this your prayer and just says simply here I am I'm available and as we sing would you just ask the Lord what he would have you to do actually I want to pray for you if you'll bow your heads across the room just ask the Lord what would you have me to do how can I respond one by giving in this offering to bless this college in Ethiopia. Another miracle offering. I believe God is going to provide those funds today. And I don't know what God's speaking to you. Just have your heart open, whatever he would give you to do, that you would just be obedient to that. And our heart would be that all of us participate in some way if it's just giving a dollar. Lord, what would you have us to do? Our ears are open. Open our eyes. Speak to us. And Lord, you may be speaking to some, not just to give, but to go. Would you begin to draw people? In Jesus' name, we're available.